Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, and today I just wanted to talk a bit about the books that I've been reading this week. Uh, these lovely little ones here. Um, I'm very much sort of giving back library books uh, kind of in that phase, um, sort of partly towards the end of the year to kind of wrap up some reads of books that I've really been wanting to read for a while, whilst also being sort of very much in the Booker project still, uh, which is coming along, um, coming along very nicely. So anyway, Let's talk a little bit about some of the books that I've been reading this week. So first up, uh, we have the book Fire Exit by Morgan Talty and uh, published by And Other Stories, a, a little indie press. I mean, I really loved this. I thought this was a really refreshing take on um, specific kind of tropes and kind of reinventing some uh, tropes as well in, in the process. So the core idea is that we have um, a man who is not Native American um, himself, but has been brought up in a community of, um, within a, a sort of tribe. He, he has been surrounded by this. Um, his partner has a child um, and this, this child is uh, therefore because of him sort of maybe not seen as being Native. However, for the the child's upbringing, they are brought up in a native uh, reservation or kind of a, a sort of tribal area. And what this means is that the child grows up with this sense of nativeness um, and is told that somebody else is her father. And so for most of the novel, we basically have this character watching from the sidelines as his daughter grows up, not knowing who he is. And I, even the opening line of um, this book is, I wanted the girl to know the truth. I wanted her to know who I was, who I really was, instead of a white man who had lived across from her uh, all of her life and watched her grow up from this side of the river. And so very handily and other stories put the first sort of paragraph on the front page. Um, but I think that really speaks to the whole novel. The whole novel really cascades from there that he spends the whole novel watching her and trying to understand where his place is. He wants to reach across and tell her, but the family all know that this is not possible um, or think that it might not be. And there's this discussion that goes throughout the book about is it is it fairer to tell um, Elizabeth that the person she thought was her father isn't her father? Um, and actually, in fact, she's grown up thinking that she's native when she's by blood, not, um, and all of these other things. So the book really goes from there. But I think, um, you know, if, if reading the book A Long List this year, if you enjoyed reading uh, Tommy Orange's book, Wandering Souls, or There There, the book before it, that book of, uh, deals a lot with addiction and alcohol issues and mental health issues related to the, the native experience, because um, there are sort of disproportionately high levels for native populations, often because of a variety of factors. And uh, in this book, Morgan Talty talks about that as well with relation to Elizabeth and with relation to other people of what things are passed down um, by blood, what things are passed down by kind of the society or the area that you grow up in and what kinds of almost curses are there that you try to avoid generationally. And I think this book is incredibly bold in its attempt to um, tackle those, to talk about them in a really refreshing way, I think, of um, what does that look like if you are trying to communicate with somebody who is genetically related to you, but where you can't tell them that, but actually there's a, there's a sort of significant health or other reason why you might want to talk to that person about it. I think this is incredibly bold and incredibly um, beautiful as well. Now for something very different, um, indeed, um, a book with an incredibly fun title, Dear Dickhead by uh, Virginie Despont um, and translated by Frank Wynne. And um, I really enjoyed King Kong Theory by her. And this is more of a novel. Um, uh, King Kong Theory is a nonfiction work. And um, this all starts from uh, there's a, a man, Oscar, who sees an actress in real life, a famous actress, uh, Rebecca Latte, who is known um, very well across France, um, but he also has a personal um, relationship to her because he, uh, she used to be friends with his sister when they were, when they were kids. And so he sees this actress in public. He posts about her, something sort of pretty awful about her appearance. 
and she messages him saying, how dare you? And it then turns into this email exchange between the two um, where they start to see that there's a lot more that they have in common. This actress starts to meditate on topics around feminism and the film industry and expectations of women within the film industry. Um, sorry, the dog has decided now's the time. Sorry, brief dog intermission there. Um, and so everybody else around starts to have these wider conversations. So Oscar starts to open up to Rebecca about his, um, uh, his addiction issues um, and going to Narcotics Anonymous and various other things. Uh, Rebecca, the actress, starts to talk about her own feelings about um, narcotics and various things as well. And in this, some really interesting conversations have to come up because Oscar has been um, publicly called out for sexual harassment or some kind of um, thing that implicates him in a sort of Me Too style movement. Um, and the actress, Rebecca, is at first really disgusted by him, but slowly comes to build this very strong, if strange, relationship with uh, with, uh, with him, particularly because um, lockdown hits at one point in this book. And so these two are suddenly cut adrift from everything they'd known before, and their emails become a regular pattern of something that keeps them afloat, where they talk very openly and candidly about their fears and their hopes and particularly addictions and various other things. But in the midst of all of this as well is this figure of Zoe, who is the woman who has publicly called out Oscar. And so this book has this very strange but very um, intriguing premise because essentially we're watching people who otherwise might not necessarily like each other bonding over something very core and very human, but equally that there is a fear that at any point something could snap because the the intricate relationships between these characters are also fragile because there's something about what Oscar has done that might mean that he is uh, sort of publicly destroyed again and what that might mean for anybody implicated at being close with him as well. So it's a really, um, really provocative novel. Um, Virginie de Despont, I mean, kind of her style, <laughs> um, but also she talks really candidly and really interestingly, I think, here about and feminism and bodies and um, notions of Me Too and cancel culture and various other things in a really intelligent way, I think, as well. Um, a slightly different book for this channel in some ways, a slightly older book that's not related to the Booker Prize, um, Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. Uh, so I was reading this for a book club um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I haven't, sorry, the, there's apparently a lot of action going on off the balcony today. Um, but the core premise, um, as sort of known by the, the Hitchcock film as well, is two men are on a train together, um, don't know each other, and it sort of spirals from there into a conversation about potential murder. Um, Bruno hates his father, who he sees as being this incredibly controlling uh, part of his life, and Guy is going through a divorce with his wife who um, has who is pregnant with another man's child and so what top spirals on from there is a sort of a thriller basically to some degree of if they're going to carry out these murders um, but also this slightly homoerotic or kind of very tense odd relationship between these two men where Bruno seems to be incredibly dependent on being liked by Guy um, and it sort of blossoms out from that. And it's, it's really interesting reading this book because the plot I know of, I don't think I've seen the film, um, the Hitchcock film, but I'm sort of, I was familiar-ish with the plot. And what actually really surprises me is how quickly this novel gets to that plot. Um, in really the opening pages, we have the conversation about the murder or potential murders. And I presumed that this would be you know, a fair bit into the story. And it's interesting how quickly she gets to the action here and how much it spirals into a really psychological story that interrogates some of these really tricksy parts of what it means to be um, uh, sort of in these difficult scenarios. Um, not to say that murder is a justified part of this, but that Bruno's um, psychological makeup is one of somebody who's been so utterly controlled and seems to have these other things that are bubbling up. There's a, many characters in the book talk about him being crazy or unpredictable or what have you. 
And there's something slightly, well, not slightly, there's something very threatening and menacing about the way he carries out um, things during the book. He is this incredibly complex character and Guy, to some degree, is living in a state of delusion as well. So there's this this really complicated matter. And it, it makes me, um, I really love The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. And this just reminds me of how good she is um, to really be able to create such a, an intricate psychological portrait of these two men and of several characters around them whilst making this very compulsively readable thriller detective style plot as well. Something very different again, um, Susanna Clarke, The Wood at Midwinter. Um, and I mentioned in my end of year tag video that um, I have still not read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell by Susanna Clarke, which I've been meaning to read for years. Um, I have a paperback of that book that I bought in maybe like 2005 or something ridiculous. Um, so it's been around for a while in my house and I've just never touched it. Um, and The Wood at Midwinter is connected family-wise to many of the parts of that story. But I just found this a really beautiful, just short story, tale, whatever. Um, it has all of these folkloric elements. There are talking animals, there are trees that have conversations about what they see happening in the forest. Um, but you also have this sort of at the heart of it, this really beautiful story um, with these lovely little images as well. It's very um, sort of decorated, um, but about a young woman who is essentially trying to work out how she might survive to the next winter and some of the conversations about her and her uh, future child and all of these other things. It, it, it feels like it borrows very heavily in a beautiful way on those really folkloric elements, the kind of fables, the tales with just the these beautiful little moments um, where you suspend disbelief and there's a magic around everything in this. And this was just such a comfort read. Um, it was just such a beautiful moment. And particularly to read her um, afterward, um, where she talks about the inspiration or the kind of elements of it and how it connects to Jonathan Strange and Miss Norell, but also her love of Kate Bush, which was a real <laughs> joy, where she starts talking about how um, various Kate Bush albums have meant a lot to her and she listened to them on loop. And many of those albums have inspired bits of her writing, um, which as a massive Kate Bush fan, <laughs> pleases me no end. Um, and actually I can kind of see there's a similar magic and um, kind of joy in that magic that appears in this book as well as um, Kate Bush's music for me. Next up, um, I've not been including many Booker books while I've been doing my weekly reads just because they will get covered in another weekly video at some point, uh, sorry, another Booker video or uh, at some point or what have you. And there's a risk that I just talk about the same book 14 times. However, um, I really wanted to talk about this one because I just found this so utterly different and really interesting as well. Uh, this is Headlong by Michael Frayn, um, who I've not read before, but I think Spies is his uh, most famous work. Um, and Headlong, I just found utterly compelling, even though it shouldn't work, I think. Um, the core idea is uh, a husband and wife move uh, to the country from London. They are both um, in the art world in various ways. One of them is, uh, they, 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 one of them is right that the husband is writing a book that is um, about various parts of art history. His wife works within art, but they much of the humor and sort of oddness of this book comes from the ways that they take utterly academic points and argue the absolute hell out of them. So, you know, one of them is um, really interested in a type of symbology and the other one believes that symbology does something different and it's such a niche point and the humour hinges a lot on that. Um, and then you get vast passages that are just about art history that again shouldn't work and shouldn't be entertaining but there's something about the slightly high and mighty tone of this book um, that makes it funny and makes it compelling I think because our central figure and um, whose name I've now entirely forgotten um, but he is just this uh, this man who is just slightly obnoxious I say slightly very very much obnoxious and he his sort of haughty tone throughout the book disguises all the things that he's missed he's oblivious to so many things in this book essentially he goes to the house of 
someone in a kind of country pile, you know, this big country house. And he sees several paintings that he thinks might be incredibly valuable. So he creates this plan to essentially make a ton of money out of him um, by pretending to sell at a certain amount and doing these various complicated sums that I didn't fully understand, but the epilogue makes it, uh, kind of the afterword makes it clear that he's researched this, um, but that would basically make him incredibly rich by lying and saying that he'd sold it for a certain amount, taking that cut, taking money from somebody else and using it for something else. And through these complicated things, that would work. But he becomes more and more obsessive about this and about decoding whose artwork this is. And it builds towards this tension that almost, again, shouldn't work of, will he sell the painting? Will he not? Will he make the money? Will he not? Um, and in the midst, he makes several errors because essentially everything needs to go right for him to be able to make this money. And I found this just so utterly compelling. It's wild. It's essentially watching some rich people quibble over various bits of art and trying to sell it. And yet this is incredibly funny because it basically punches down on those people and sorry, punches up on those people and sort of pillories how silly the whole art world or the whole discussion in this book is. And last but not least, um, another book I mentioned in my end of year tag um, that I wanted to read, and that is Plotters uh, by Lizzie Dearden. Um, and it's all about UK based terrorists um, and particularly terrorist activity that had been happening at a certain time. Um, and it's incredibly well researched. And I think, again, it, it, there's something very interesting about the way this is written, I think, that it it has that compelling, not thriller, sort of message, but it, it kind of has that incredibly compulsively readable quality to it with the, the real realisation that you are reading something very true and based in, in something that happened. And it makes it just that more terrifying um, because you are very aware that there are... Essentially, it's, it's quite unnerving, right, to read about something that's going on in the world that's to some degree out of your control, right? That the, there could be people plotting activities and that is of potential risk to you. You know, I live in London um, and so, you know, London is a city that would be targeted. And so you read about these things and this is not only one form of terrorism. A lot of this book also discusses, for example, white nationalism and um, alt-right kind of style people and their acts of terrorism as well, and the ways that this feeds into narratives for, quote unquote, the other side, that, um, that white nationalists and other extremists almost need each other to kind of keep this wheel of outrage and of fear going, that one commits an activity, the other responds, the other responds again. And it's terrifying what comes up in this book, but I think like with, um, many other books that are written about incredibly difficult topics. I think this covers it with a great deal of sensitivity and cleverness and, and deep research and is just, yeah, really powerfully done, even about an incredibly difficult topic. That feels like an incredibly dark place to end the video on. But those are the books that I've been reading um, this week. And um, I hope you're having a really lovely week. Almost dropping the books there. Um, yeah, I hope you're having a really lovely week and things are going well. I hope reading is going well. We've just had our book a winner this week. Um, there are various other prizes that I think are all happening now. We're also getting very much into end of year season for top books of the year and all of that kind of thing, which I'm compiling at the moment. There are some books that may sneak onto the list that I might read in the next few weeks. Um, particularly Ali Smith, I've got my eye on that one. But I, apart from that, I think uh, a lot of those are relatively locked in. But I'm excited to hear from you. What kind of books are you reading? What have been some of your standouts from this year? And I hope you're all keeping really well. Have a lovely week and see you all soon. Bye-bye.